Yo, what's up everybody, it's Tuna. I hope you guys have had a fantastic leaf start. This video is intended to be more of a news post and sort of update you guys with everything that's going on. I'll be going through some of the top Reddit posts as well as sharing some of my findings with the lead mechanic and the things I've learned on day one. And hopefully you guys can sort of get a better idea and a better picture of what the league is like, what we're looking to do, and essentially all of the cool stuff that you can achieve. So the first post here is from uh, Shatrest1992 and he has opened 12,200 veiled scarabs veiled scarabs are kind of like um, stack decks but scarabs and you can acquire those you know through things like sanctum and also in standard of course which is where this was done from people who have had their um awakened sextants um you know or just sextants as well turned into scarabs so he opened 12,000 of them and we can see here that we have gained a general understanding of the weightings for them for veiled scarabs now what I have gathered from this picture and from what people have sort of been feeding me as well as my own drops and stuff like that is that there is a massive discrepancy between the scarabs that we are getting from Veiled Scarabs in comparison to scarabs that we are dropping in game. And now because we look at this and um, there is a huge, huge uh, amount of like, um, you know, it's very skewed towards giving you the lower and the mid tier scarabs. And some of these scarabs are extremely rare. Like, for example, you look here. Um, the divination scarabs are just like crazy, crazy rare. Like you have 19 divination uh, wing scarabs and a total of 12,000, which is just absolutely crazy. You have 10 harvest. Um, so yeah, the weights are extremely low. Now, um, the thing about the drop logic to them is that we, I, as far as I know, um, quantity and rarity actually does affect um, what scarabs are able to drop and then in addition to that we also have of course atlas passive skills and those atlas passive skills can then sort of allow you to uh, specify what types of scarabs you want by blocking certain scarabs that are more rare but what we can discern from this picture is that there are certain types of scarabs that you might want to block um, you know for example like beyond since there are the most common type for example or you know of course like you don't want to be dropping beyond if you want to be farming those but generally this gives us a better picture and a better idea of the scarabs that you'd want to drop uh, uh sorry rather the scarabs that you would want to block uh, to get the most expensive ones now poe ninja is going to be updating with the price of scarabs and it's going to give you real time um sort of a picture of what the economy is going to be looking like for these so a good idea is to go on PO Ninja and check the prices for those and the lowest prices, uh, you know, the lowest prices and then essentially block those scarabs. But also by uh, looking at the weightings here, we can also ascertain that we just want to be blocking certain things uh, in order to increase the chances for other scarabs to drop. Now, there's not a huge lot to say about the league mechanic itself as of right now, as a lot of people are still discovering how to min-max and how to farm it. However, there are some really cool modifiers that you can expect to find from the Lantern of Aramore, which is essentially the lantern, you know, the, the screen that pops up as you're walking into a map, right? So you can see here that um, this user found a 2% chance to drop an additional Divine Orb from pack monsters, which means that there is a potential for you to drop a ton of Divine Orbs. And this is kind of intended to be sort of like the Divine Altar of this league. It's extremely rare. I've yet to find one myself, but um, some lucky people are able to find this and in some cases drop even stacks of Divines. And of course, those Divines are also affected by Altar modifiers, things like Currency Dupe and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, um, there will be strategies this league where you are speed farming, Lantern of Aramors, and then um, looking to basically find these types of modifiers and also, um, you know, buffing them through altars. Now, one thing that is like slightly concerning about that is that you are actually able to essentially um, brute force RNG, right? So essentially what you could do, and I keep saying essentially, but what you can do is you can have like maps here and I'm just going to be burning a couple of Y maps to show you this. But you can have a map and you can enter and this the Lantern of Aramor will pop up. And essentially, I could just do whatever I want here and you can enter. But in case you don't get a modifier that you actually want, what you can do is you can just chuck it in again until you actually find um, one of those modifiers. And I think this is kind of very abusable and something that GGG should look into because it, it is it is not, um, you know, it's a very degenerate type of playstyle. And you know that people are 100% going to be burning through maps in order to get the, um, the type of rewards that they want by just basically going through and, you know, chucking all of that stuff until they get um, the, um, the good rewards that they want. Now, the golden uh, rewards, those things can be actually buffed by the Atlas passive tree as well. Um, 
for example, here at the bottom left of the tree, you have some nodes that will grant you increased devotion modifiers. And what that means is that, you know, those golden modifiers become more common and you can increase the effect of those as well. So yeah, you'll have people just be sitting here and finding, you know, oh, cool. Um, uh, strongest monster in the pack gets uh, additional alterations. And this, this would be divine orbs, right? So yeah, this is potentially a very degenerate way to play the game, but it is something that has been enabled this league. And it's not something that I recommend anybody would do. But it is there and it is news, so I felt like prevent, uh, presenting it to you guys. All right, and this wouldn't be a new league if, um, you know, it didn't come along with some absolutely broken, stupid uh, <laughs> scaling and, um, yeah, uh, overtuned stuff. So this was posted by Imperium42069 uh, four two zero six nine and, <laughs> yo, nice name. Uh, yeah, and this is uh, basically showing what Team 17 maps can look like once you roll some nasty modifiers on there. So let's just observe and enjoy. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that looks fun. And as you can see here uh, from the modifiers, let me put the screen a little bit better there so you guys can see. It's 233% uh, of physical damage as extra as well as rare and unique monsters spawn tormented spirits on reaching low life. It contains drowning orbs, which is basically like Eater of Worlds, you know, those orbs that basically kill you if you walk into them. All magic monsters and normal monsters in the area um, are in a union of souls. And if you don't know what union of souls is, is basically as you kill them, they will get bigger and stronger and tougher. And it's just completely broken. And one other thing, um, soul eater is just absolutely fucked. Like if you guys have done burial chambers this league, you'll realize that, yeah, it's not okay. Basically, like you, you can stack soul eater up to 45 times. What it does is it gives you 2% damage reduction per stack, as well as attack and cast speed and damage. And uh, yeah, so you get to uh, a Lyra by the end of there, and if you don't nuke her fast, she can get up to 90% damage reduction and absolutely ram you. It is not exactly fun. However, you know, the upside of that is that potentially once you get head on her, you'll be practically Jesus Christ himself. But um, yeah, uh, it's, not very, it's not very fun to interact with uh, on a map-to-map -map basis, <laughs> unfortunately. But hopefully it's looked at. And um, yeah, hopefully GGG has our back on this one because it seems pretty absurd in some situations. And yeah, you'll have to be very careful about certain map mods in T17s as well, because as you can see here, we have um, some pretty ridiculous shit happening as well. So that's, uh, yeah. All right. So next we'll look at some of the new uniques. Now there's only two that I haven't found that are quite interesting. And the next, uh, the first one is the utmost. It's a gold amulet and um, yeah, which has a rarity implicit, but it drops corrupted because GGG does not want you to modify this. And what this allows for them to do is for them to um, essentially give you modifiers that are stuck in place. So depending on how lucky you are or unlucky, you will get either really good uh, really good rolls or really bad rolls. So you can see it rolls up to 30% suppression, up to 5% max resistance, uh, up to 40% attack and cast speed, and up to 20% elemental penetration. It is absolutely insane. And this, uh, this amulet is, uh, like actually just wild and um yeah i could see it being one of the chase uniques for many people and i kind of like the fact that it's sort of like a gamble unique it, it incentivizes people to keep going after the bosses and hopefully you know um farm um farm this amulet and get really good rolls right so you can either luck out or you can get unlucky unfortunately of course as probably i will <laughs> when i farm this but yeah it's a really cool amulet and it's very interesting and OP Mayhem Potter actually specified that it is uh, a Uber drop and it's dropped from Uber Exarch, Elder, Maven, and Eater. And what they do is they drop fragments of them and you assemble them. For example, Uber Elder fragments and stuff. Like you just assemble them and then uh, they become the utmost and the utmost is essentially corrupted. So that's kind of a unique and fun way to piece amulets together because not only does it, um, you know, allow for people that farm these bosses to then just uh, sell the fragments to other people but it also allows degenerate gamblers to just you know piece these together and um you know hope for a really good amulet result so that's pretty that's pretty cool and um yeah i mean ggg are really smart when it comes to unique design and i think this is one of these uniques that is actually like hit the mark and i think it's pretty damn cool so yeah definitely props to them the next drop is the apostate which drops from uh uber cortex and this one is quite interesting because it allows you to gain maximum life instead of maximum energy field from equipped armor items however this base type itself does not have any defensive properties it is ha it has like as you can see 
zero defensive properties, but it does have all res and strength. But it enables some pretty crazy um, life stacking shenanigans because, you know, you still have, of course, the gloves, the boots, the helmet and jewelry as well, if you want to go that way as well. But yeah, and the belt too, to get uh, a ton of energy shield. Like, for example, crystal belt would give you um, energy shield implicit, which is like a lot of life that you can get from the crystal belt or, um, you know, uh, like sorcerers, boots, um, like all that kind of stuff. Um, getting a crazy huber circlet it's like you can get a ton of life this way and you can get way more life than you would be able to otherwise so yeah, you're going to be seeing some pretty interesting life stacking shenanigans with this chest and you know it's i think it's pretty cool some Rathpith glove and um globe enjoyers are going to be definitely using this one as potentially one of their best in slots but <clears throat> we'll have to see about that because the stats on it are actually honestly like quite shit aside for this um unique property which you know, in itself is actually very enabling and it sort of enables a very unique playstyle as, um, you know, as I previously said, I think GGG knocks it out of the park with uniques. They do a very, very good job with that stuff. So yeah, very cool unique as well. Now, the next thing that we'll talk about is um, the lead mechanic and deterministic crafting and some tips and tricks. And this was posted by Exterior and, you know, props to Exterior. Thank you so much for taking the time to actually be posting your findings um to the subreddit and you know educating people on leak start most people are just out there blasting and not taking their time to educate other people on how um how it works and stuff like that so i really appreciate you taking the time to do that but i will be linking this one in the description because it's quite long and most of you probably have to like actually study but essentially what uh what he explains is uh, how the lean mechanic functions and how you're able to deterministically uh, craft certain items by uh, applying certain properties from the corpses Okay, so OP goes through an example. Let's assume that he, um, you know, he's talking about crafting certain uh, some boots, and um, he wants to craft armor boots. So what he will do is he will start by uh, applying corpses that give uh, no intelligence requirements, as well as armor items uh, give no dexterity requirements, and this guarantees that he will get a strength base. From here, if he wants live movement speed and some resistances, uh, he will apply, you know, plus two hundred base speed uh, speed tier modifiers as well as 1,000% increased uh, speed modifiers. So these are two separate corpses that you can apply. Then you'll have 200 flat with 1,000% more common life modifiers, 200 flat defense with 400% scarcer defense modifiers. And this might seem a little counterintuitive, but he explains it a little later why that is the case. Uh, but you can put in even more scarcer and more common if you want, uh, but he just uh, used this example to show off um, you know, the calculations and that kind of stuff. So. Uh, why does he put 200 defense modifiers on there? Well, um, the, that's because, you know, ideally um, you would like to make defense modifiers rare. However, uh, as he explains, uh, Mark during the interview has actually confirmed that it removes bad mods. So plus 100 will remove half of the bad modifiers and 100 would then remove half of the ones that are left. So you'll get two thirds uh, of the leftover mods that um you know you will make even rarer so you're cutting off two-thirds of the bad defense modifiers that way and that leaves only the top um the top third meaning that you have essentially gotten rid of two-thirds of the defense modifiers and then additionally he gets 400 percent scarcer modifiers to make sure that um you know they are rolling more rarely so uh in this in this example his weightings will look like 1200 uh, 1250 waiting for defense modifiers Speed modifiers will have 10,000 weighting and can only hit 30% movement speed because of the base rating that he applied. Life modifiers have 20,000 weighting and can only roll T1 or 2 life. And um, the rarity of item 2,000 weighting, uh, you know, you can't, you can't actually affect this because it, you know, there's no rarity um, corpses and stuff like that. Then you also have hybrid life um, with a 6,000 weighting and can only hit T1 hybrid. So as you can see, it's pretty damn deterministic. And once you actually put this craft together, um, you'll be able to basically get a good pair of um, boots or things like that. But there are still many modifiers that you cannot target. Now, I don't want to go too far into details as this probably should be a separate video of its own. But I will definitely link this post here as it gives a very good example of what you can do in endgame as well and the crazy stuff that you can guarantee. And this mechanic is, um, you know very very insane for crafting high tier mod uh, high tier items and stuff like that however i think that it's extremely tedious and it's not something that i would really enjoy doing myself like one thing that i really don't like about the mechanics specifically is um just this right it's an absolute mess like so 
putting corpses inside of uh, coffins and things like that. I think it's very half-baked, it's very tedious to do, and to basically get an item together that is of good, um, yeah, that is of value. You have to get so many of these, and um, in, in maps you'll have to kind of be like filtering them by just looking at them and stuff like that, but honestly this is a video of its own and I don't want to go too into it, but this video essentially was just supposed to be about the news and stuff like that. And I hope this has sort of provided you guys with a better overview of the league so far and day one findings of uh, many players and whatnot. Also, if you are playing Mike Sanguinate Miner, make sure you link automation to Deadly Mines because that will make your mines uh, auto trigger and it's really, really nice. But yeah, if you guys want to check out what I do, uh, I'm live on Twitch and YouTube. So you can basically hop by, say hello or ask any questions or basically just chill out and banter. Um, and I appreciate every single one of you. I hope you guys found this video helpful and entertaining. And I hope you guys have had a really good league start. Love you all. 07, peace out, chat.